Well, we are at two minutes past six. So um, we might get underway, whānau. A tēnā rā koutou, a te mea tūtai, me mei ki ngā rongarawa. Nā te mea nāna nei ngā taonga me ngā tikanga mo tātou i ngā wā katoa. A tūrua ki a koutou kua we atu ki te pō, ki tō te ārai ngā mei ngā tangi aroa a ki a koutou, o ki atu ki te kāinga o te kāianga. Ki a tātou katoa nei rā te mei mai o a, ki a koutou kua ono mai nei kei rongi i te ipurangi. Ko ngā maunga, ngā awa, ngā uenua, ngā moana, ngā marae maa o te motu ka tupi mari nei i aro a kia koutou. Nau mai, ara mai. A me kara kia tātou. A kia ora te marino, kia waka papapauna me te moana, kia tere te karo i roi, e uara e mā tātou i tēnei rangi. Aro a atu, aro a mai, tātou i a tātou katoa, uie, tai ki he. Kia ora koutou, welcome to our session this evening. We um, discovered when we were preparing for the session that this time neither suits our New Zealand audience nor a European audience. <laughs> it's right on dinner time for us here in Aotearoa, New Zealand and breakfast time um, elsewhere in the world. However, um, Welcome to this interactive webinar provided under the umbrella of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science as part of the virtual laboratory series on healthy and resilient oceans. Our team of presenters for the session are from the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and we are humbled to be able to share with you some of the work we're involved in. We'll start by introducing ourselves as your panel of presenters, followed by a short overview of what we expect to cover in the next roughly hour and a half. Uh, he uri a hau o te kāwi maunga me te awanganui. Ko Ngāti Rangi me te ati aunui a pāpā rangi tōku iwi. Linda Faulkner is my name and I hail from the family of mountains and the Wanganui River situated in the central North Island of New Zealand. I'm the Deputy Director of Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge and will be hosting and facilitating this evening's session. I will hand over to my fellow panelists to introduce themselves, starting with you, Anaru. A tēnā koutou. A tēnei te mihi atu ki o koutou, ko tāi mai nei e tēnei wā. E hara mai i roto i nga tini ahua tango o te wā. Ano re, a kei te mihi, a kei te mihi. Ki a koe, e Linda, e whakapuari e tēnei hui i topa, tēnā koe huri no koutou mā, tēnā koutou kato. Ko toko maru te maunga, ko wairau te awa, e uri au o ngā hapū, nga te pare tona, te arawaire, te iwi o ngā te rāroa. No reira, ko Andrew Luke tēnei, ko rero atu nei, ki a koutou i tēnei wā. Kia ora. Kia ora, Anaru. Jason. Kia ora tātou, tai tūpa nā mihi kua mihia ki nā mate, ki te huna ora anō hoki, ko tātou wera, kai te mihi atu ki a koe, Linda, i tēnei wā. Ko mā tātou e te waka ko tūhoi, ko te whakatoa hea, ko nā te awa o ko iwi, Me wera atu o ngā iwi, kai tērā o ngā mauna, ko ngā tika ungunu ki te wairua, tētahi taha no hoki. Kia ora everyone, my name is Jason Mika, I'm an Associate Professor in the School of Management at Massey University in Palmerston North, and very pleased to be here. Kia ora. Kia ora Jason Kane. He tautoko te mihi. Kia tātou i tēnei wā, ko mau o te maunga, he pua wau ngā wai e riri ana nō waipapa ki te mōna o Tauranga. He kōpota au nō Tauranga mōna, ko kei ntai o ko tōku ingoa. I am a fellow researcher with a research group called Manaki Te Omi. Kia ora. Kia ora, Kane. 
So the title of our session is Te Au o Te Moana, and that title and theme was introduced to us in Sustainable Seas by Kaumatua Joe Harawera, and recognises that like each of us, the moana, our oceans, have a distinct voice, and to hear that voice is to understand the state of its well-being. To enable us to hear Te Au o Te Moana, Sustainable Seas aims to bring together the knowledge and philosophy of two worldviews, science and mātauranga Māori, or Māori knowledge. As Joe Harawera says, understanding the voice of the ocean enables us to be more connected with the heartbeat of Tangaroa and Hine Moana, the key deities of the Moana or of the ocean within a Māori, uh, New Zealand and Indigenous worldview, and to turn the tide on the challenges our oceans currently face. Over the next 45 minutes or so, um, we aim to firstly provide a brief overview of some of the historical context here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, within which marine management and our research sits. Secondly, an introduction to the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge and our approach to achieving our aims through a two world view lens. And then two of our research leaders, Kane and Jason, will be providing some insights to the, rich, the richness that comes from Indigenous-led research and the opportunity for those insights to lead to transformational change. After those short presentations, we'll have a bit of a panel discussion uh, with the opportunity for you to ask any questions. And please feel free to put questions in the Q&A box provided. Um, and we'll work through them as best we can. Remember, no questions are silly ones, and to my fellow panellists, no answer is a wrong one. I will hand over first to you, Anaru, to provide some context for the session. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Apologies first, so um, in terms of I've never said what I do and where I, where I come from, per se, um, so I chair the Kahui Māori for the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. So that's the Māori advisory group to the governance um, group of the challenge, but also to the rest of the challenge as well. Uh, other hats I wear is um, I'm the deputy chair of Te Rungang o Ngāti Rārua, based in the top of the South, um, top of the South Island, and also uh, in a work capacity, uh, my role is Tumwaki Te Kahui Aio, so I lead a uh, Māori research team at the Cawthorn Institute based in Nelson. Kill that. So bear with me here. Um, <clears throat> just to give us some context as we um, move into our presentation. Um, just wanted to show kind of those who aren't from within New Zealand um, uh, where we are located within the South Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, it's small landmass really. Um, we're and covered or surrounded by quite a, a big ocean called Demont Temoana Nuiakiwa, so Pacific Ocean. Um, place that we call home um, as Māori, I say I'll start talking about Fano Hapu and Iwi. So Fano being a family collective, Hapu being a sub-tribal collective, and Iwi um, a collective of Hapu, making up a, a, an Iwi grouping. So. Um, <clears throat> Just a bit more context, um, some say uh, no, being called Aotearoa New Zealand. For some, Aotearoa refers to the land of the long, long white cloud, that being in the North Island. And in the South Island there, uh, in this particular diagram or picture, New Zealand, um, the South Island, uh, known sometimes as Te Waipaunamu, um, especially for the iwi that are based within the South Island. And we have to our east is um, Rekohu Wari, uh, Whare Kauri, uh, the Chatham Islands, and then further south, um, at the bottom of South Island, we have some other islands, but Rakiura or Stuart Island as well. So just given some context where sometimes our lens as Māori, um, we look at it a little bit differently than, than one, the rest of the country, but let alone the rest of the world. Um, Kilda, next, next uh, slide, please. Here, just some more context. So 4000 BC to our left, uh, so 6,000 years ago, roughly, um, migration started to happen, and for us as Māori, for uh, many of us, we talk about coming from somewhere, maybe potentially the Middle East, but Asia, uh, into the into the um, Pacific itself, uh, around by 4000 BC, 1500 BC as well, coming into uh, what is now known as Vanuatu, um, moving into Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, um, so we're going through our Melanesian, Micronesian and the Polynesian 
uh, concepts within the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Cook Islands of Aratunga and Aitutaki, many stories of uh, some of our seafaring waka um, or canoes, uh, the big ones, um, visiting all these places. Um, and then around that 1200 AD, uh, through French Polynesia or Tahiti, we move into uh, Hawaii, some migrations that to Rapa Nui or Easter Island, um, closer to South America. And then traveling southwards um, on some currents um, that were known, that uh, um, Aotearoa, the Waipo number was always known um, uh, in terms of the great navigator called Kupe, um, and hence where the name Aotearoa has come from when his wife uh, sighted first sighted land. So it was a place that for Māori, they knew that it was here, and so um, decided to journey to these places. Next slide, please, Linda. Further context, so the piece and delivery I'll be giving in here is just, it's going to be related to seafood um, and the connection Māori have with food and with the marine environment um, per se. Given that we travelled the distance that we've travelled um, across the ocean to be here um, and then adapting to the what was here at the time um, and here I have um, um, sea urchins, the ones in the, the prickly looking things, spiky looking things in the uh, to the right of the screen and then to the top left of the screen is what is eaten generally from inside those spiky things. Um, so we're just having, uh, just showing that, that connection we have with food as Māori and down on the bottom that's a particular um, a photo of a group of uh, different whānau and hapu and iwi um, taken in a place called Motueke, Te Awhina Marae, uh, uh, of a project that was done in phase one within the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, which was called Hipo Toko Manawa. So we're just collecting that information and knowledge um, of how to do things and how that is passed down through generations to present time of how to interact with the marine environment. And, um, and in this instance, it was to do with fishing um, and, and, and seafood and, and collection and harvesting. Uh, next slide, please, Linda. So I'll jump into... Um, what was so pre-1840, for those who are not sure about 1840, it will become evident um, in the next couple of slides why 1840 is significant. Um, so pre-1840, whānau hapu iwi or hapu within New Zealand at that time um, had the management rights um, within a particular area. So keeping in relation to the coastal environment, um, those hapu who uh, occupied certain parts of the coastline would have the management rights of that piece of coastline as well as the land um, adjacent to that coastline. Um, and at that time, pre-1840, access to those resources um, was recognised and adhered to um, by certain rules or tikanga and kawa, um, the tikanga being the, the ability to and what we should do and will not do, the, the protocols in the kawa being the etiquette of how it might be done and when it might be done. So there was unwritten, recognised rules that um, was followed by, by, by hapu. Uh, sustainability indicators. So we're talking about the environmental indicators that tell us when something could be done or when not to do something, when to harvest from the marine environment, when not to harvest from the marine environment. So that's why when we talk about uh, tohu, um, those were all in place and something that was exercised regularly. Um, and it was just, you know, that's a way of way of life and how you operate, and um, and that brings into also the tohu around the um, um, the time of the moon, what moon, what phase the moon is in in any particular time. So that those sort of environmental indicators were looked out for or observed. Uh, access was managed by certain experts, and in this case, I'm, uh, I can refer to what we call tohunga, who could do recite uh, things like uh, karaki or prayer. Um, well, yeah or say prayer, um, to enable to do things and access the resource. Um, if something had happened previously, and I'll say, for example, for a, someone who passed away in the marine environment, we might harvest food. So they might do a karakia that places a restriction um, to go into that area. These, this will be covered later on anyway in the presentation. It's a bit more explanation of breach of rules subject to penalty. So utu. Um, if something wasn't adhered to, those rules weren't adhered to, there were consequences. Uh, could have been ostracized from the hapu, and it was pretty severe, or um, 
it could also enable, um, um, you know, not to be able to touch something for a certain period of time. Next slide, please. Just wanted to put this up here. So this again is related to the pre-1840. Um, it's just a, a diagram that was done by an artist um, called Parkinson, who had came out to New Zealand at uh, the time of Captain James Cook. So Captain James Cook um, arriving in New Zealand for the first time in 1769 and returned two more times um, up to um, 1877. Uh, what it's showing is that the Māori at that time of Cook's arrival were doing trade anyway. So you already had sailors and, um, uh, and sealers and whalers already occupying this land, had already come in. Um, so it was a trade of some sort, bartering that was occurring. So I just wanted it's just a bit more context in terms of the, the next couple of slides. Next one, please, Linda. Te Tiriti or Waitangi. So there was a treaty that was de um, developed, um, two versions of that treaty. And so this is the 6th of February, 1840. Um, there was an indigenous or Māori version of the treaty and an English version. The translations that you see on the screen are from the, uh, is a very summarized um, translation of the Māori version of the treaty. So three articles in this instance, article one, um, the Crown can have the right to govern over the lands here in within New Zealand or Aotearoa to Waipaunamu. Um, and that's just through um, uh, mostly intended to the British sub subjects that were here. However, um, Māori enabled, you know, for the version of the treaty that they read um, or heard was, yeah, we'll um, give the governing rights to, to someone else. Kawanatanga was the word that was used. Article two. Someone else is doing the governing of the, the British subjects. Doesn't uh, it allows Māori guarant guarantees Māori full exclusive undisturbed possession of lands, estates, forests, and fisheries, and that word all their treasure. So Taonga, everything that was important to them um, was still, you know, they had undisturbed uh, possession and, and full access to it. Um, and so and so, why not um, think of it letting someone else govern? So uh, others in the country that went Māori. Uh, Article three, um, so all the rights and, and duties that were afforded to the British subjects was also extended to Māori. Uh, so when you, in a, in a simple term at the time and understanding the, the indigenous version of the treaty, it did sound like a, in my opinion, a, a reasonable deal or partnership that could occur from this. Next slide please, Linda. So post-1840, um, various acts, and I'm going to keep this towards um, related to fisheries, um, various acts were passed um, by the Crown at the time um, that precluded Māori exercising their full exclusive undisturbed um, possession of, of their forest lands and waters. Um, so with the, with the treaty in front of mine, um, you know, <laughs> The intent of the, the Treaty of Waitangi was more of a partnership and an, an enabling things to continue as they were for Māori. I'll give an example of when that didn't occur, and that was in 1866. So it was the first piece of um, fisheries-related legislation that was passed here in New Zealand um, called the Oyster Fisheries Act. Uh, what that enabled was... Um, uh, provided for the leasing of oyster beds for commercial purposes. That sounds okay, but no specific provision for Māori. So it um, allowed that to occur, except it didn't allow Māori to sell oysters from their own reserves, oyster reserves that they had. When you think back about what the, the Treaty of Waitangi was in, uh, intending, then the, uh, the, there's a, a contrary um, uh, piece of legislation that was enabled. Next slide, please, Linda. Um, so um, jumping forward, um, uh, we had the uh, Treaty of Waitangi Act in 1975. So that enabled uh, Whānau Hapu Iwi Māori to, to present their case to the government or to the Waitangi Tribunal of the grievances they felt or the breaches that were done by others um, of what was intended in the Treaty of Waitangi. So, um, so different things occurred in 1983, we had the um, 
Fisheries Act in New Zealand, which started to create the, the, the use for um, a commercial right to be um, allowed for commercial fishes. 1986 was the quota management system, um, which enabled those, those rights to be exercised, and that's where the, the, the quota was allocated um, by government. Um, Māori, a group, group of Māori, I'll say, started to see, well, this isn't fair. Um, with uh, the Treaty of Waitangi guaranteed certain things. Um, as history has shown, um, provisions have not been made for. Māori fishing rights right up to 1986 had never actually been defined and what it might look like and what it might mean in, in the current time. So um, 1989, the establishment of the uh, Māori um, Fisheries Act, so um, that being 10% um, of all existing quota and allocation be made to Māori in, in whatever shape or form it could be made in. Um, and then 1992, jumping forward there, we were um, what we call the Treaty of Waitangi Fisheries Settlement Act. So that settled all claims um, and breaches or grievances relating to fishing um, made by Māori um, to all their fishing rights under the Article 2 of the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, what it also did was split or define what non-commercial and commercial components are of Māori fishing rights. Um, non-commercial uh, enable the provisions of what we call customary food gathering regulations or kaimawana customary fishing regulations and the establishment of mātaitai reserves. Just to say here mātaitai, the word mātaitai is used as a um, in some places as, as areas where you can collect seafood without having to dive under the water to get it. So um, generally you might not include fin fish. However, um, it's more the, the, the literal subtitle um, um, species. And also on the commercial side, um, quota and fishing assets were, were allocated, well, not allocated, um, a pool of resources were, were formed um, and, and also indicated that 20% of any new quota that come into the quota management system and will be allocated or provided um, for Māori. The allocation of is, is another story, but just to just put in some context here. Next slide, please, Linda. And just to show what I said in a simple form, um, customary fishing was seen by Whānau Hapu Iwi as, a, as everything you can think of now to do with fishing. It's for personal use, it's for trading, it's for bartering, it's for sale. Um, but the 1992 defined those rights to be non a component being non-commercial and a component being commercial. So just, yes, I've skipped with the specifics around fishing and marine environment, um, but just to give a little bit of context of where um, the connection that Māori had with the marine environment, but also the, uh, some of the barriers that created them ex um, exercising what they've always known and how to interrelate um, their connectedness with that marine environment. Kia ora. Kia ora, Anaru. Thank you for that. Now I'll just provide, um, so, so yeah, Anaru provided a bit of context for um, the, the environment, if you like, that the um, National Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge is operating within. And now I'll give you a bit of an um, outline of the challenge. So Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge was established as one of 11 National Science Challenges and funded over 10 years to achieve a mission set by government to enhance utilisation of marine resources within environmental and biological limits. Given our unique context here in Aotearoa, we chose to take a very holistic view of this mission, a view that recognises that benefit comes with responsibility, that it's the nature of our relationship with the ocean that will ultimately determine whether that balance will lead to well-being. As Anaru pointed out, as an island nation in a vast ocean with history and knowledge that connects us first to our whānau or relations in the wider Pacific region and then beyond, we've aimed to establish a research program that reflects a uniquely Aotearoa approach to placing our oceans or the moana at the very heart of what we do to achieve healthy marine ecosystems that provide value for New Zealanders. Our work brings together researchers and research partners from a wide range of disciplines and sectors that reflect the needs and interests of government, industry and communities, 
but also and importantly, the indigenous people of Aotearoa or Māori. We aim to create a holistic approach to marine management that's founded on our relationships and connection to the moana. Like most relationships, there is complexity, baggage and challenge, but there's also beauty, mutual benefit and opportunity and our work is aimed at addressing the former and enhancing the latter. To manage the balance between healthy ecosystems and a marine economy that prioritizes restoration and sustainability, we've developed an ecosystem-based management approach unique to our specific context in Aotearoa. With input from our partners, we've developed a set of principles for ecosystem-based management that can support and frame our relationships with the moana. The principles you see here reflect the values, aspirations and realities of that relationship. And it's these principles that have informed our research priorities and approach. I won't go through all of the principles, but would just briefly mention a couple of them. Firstly, you'll see the co-governance principle. That principle is one is an important one and recognises the historical background Anaru referred to. It also reflects some findings from an exploratory project conducted early in Sustainable Seas by Sarah Jane Chakiwai, who looked at some indigenous case study experiences internationally with EBM. For us here in Aotearoa, this principle reflects the rights and interests of Māori in relation to the moana here in New Zealand, including the terms of our right to relate to the moana in accordance with our own knowledge and practice. The other principle of note is that of of our connection and interaction with the moana should be founded upon knowledge, primarily science and mātauranga Māori or Māori knowledge, but also knowledge, values and priorities of our communities. So how is it, um, how do we consider uh, our research through two world lenses? We will notice in the map on the right, the map of New Zealand on the right, it reflects the way we see and think about New Zealand in an everyday, primarily Western context, the North Island and the South Island. In con conversation, we regularly refer to North as up and South as down. The map on the left for many, uh, for many Māori better reflects the way we see Aotearoa. It has two main islands whose Māori names explain the origins of those islands. The island on the top of the image is known by some as Te Waka a Maui, or the canoe of Māori, of Maui, sorry, uh, who was a well-known ancestor in New Zealand and actually in the wider, in wider Polynesia. The island at the bottom of the image is known by some as Tika Maui, or the fish of Maui, with its head nearest the waka and its tail stretching out beyond its body. So immediately we see our connections of our, our conception, sorry, of our place. Market differ, uh, differ markedly and have rich knowledge and history behind them. In sustainable seas, we've provided for this two world view as best we can in a variety of ways, from our overarching strategy and the structure of our projects to the diversity of our research partners and, pro, and um, approaches to bringing knowledge together into life. Another project completed in the first half of Sustainable Seas provided a working model for us to operate within and applying the two world view approach. Led by Dr. Sean Awatere of uh, Landcare Research, this project conceptualized how we might bring together science and mātauranga Māori or Māori knowledge to frame our research and in fact to frame how we work in partnership for the betterment of our relationship and responsibilities with the moana. A waka taurua, or double-hulled vessel common in the Pacific during pre-European times provides a useful way to frame our work and to bring together two world views in a way that preserves the integrity of each. So it's not about incorporating one knowledge into another or merging the two to produce an homogenized whole, but rather recognizes that it's okay to think, know and do things differently as long as we can come together in a negotiated space when and where we need to. This enables us to benefit from the richness of both and to find innovation and opportunities that might otherwise not be possible. As we work through the early years of Sustainable Seas, we canvass the views of Māori leaders, Māori organisations and communities. 
to understand their aspirations in relation to the moana and what sustainable seas could do to help them achieve those aspirations. And these um, five points listed uh, became the filter and lens for us to inform our research focus approach, outputs and outcomes. They were to continue to explore Māori knowledge for insights and models for an improved connection and relationship with the moana, to provide clear and implementable pathways for restoring tr the treaty partnership envisaged by the treaty as Anaru identified, exploring new commercial marine interests and opportunities using utilising Māori knowledge, people and resources, building frameworks and guidelines for ensuring the application of Māori commercial interests is based on Māori knowledge and practice, and ultimately ensuring that our research empowers and enables Māori communities. How have we done that? Well, we've prioritised Māori-led and partner projects focusing in these areas, supporting Māori, iwi, hapu and whānau, or the tribes and sub-tribes at local level, to reclaim and restore their traditional and contemporary knowledge and practice, Māori ways of knowing, being and doing relevant to the moana. We're developing tools and models to support tribal and Māori commercial decision making, exploring Māori approaches to economy and looking at the relationship between tribal law and government law, including a focus on understanding the enablers and barriers between the two. And finally, identifying what the options for a partnership approach to marine management like that first envisaged in the Treaty of Waitangi back in 1840 for ocean governance and management. We already have a number of outputs from our research in these spaces available on the Sustainable Seas website and have a number of projects ongoing. And I'm now going to hand over to Kane and then Jason to share some of their Indigenous lead research. Mm, um, thanks again, Linda and uh, Anaru, for your kōrero. I, I definitely learned something myself. Um, so what I'm going to share today is uh, a bit of a snapshot, I guess, into some of the, one of the projects that we're doing in Sustainable Seas um, called Ngā Tohu o Te Ao. Um, and it has an, a distinct focus on looking at maramataka um, as a way to reclaim and preserve Indigenous knowledge um, of Te Aotearoa. Or the long standing natural world. Um, can you change the slide, please, Linda? Um, I think it's really important to um, highlight um, that the project, uh, although it has, I guess, three main uh, focus outcomes, um, it also has a distinct, unique um, puna of knowledge um, that's contributing to the project. Um, what we aim to do in, in the space is really look at how do we co-develop a process um, to reclaim ancestral knowledge of, uh, of Te Aotearoa, uh, both in a place-based sense and then um, across the Mutu Wai. Um, we also want to understand how that reclaimed ancestral knowledge of Te Aotearoa um, can be reflected on through practice. And then the final component that we are utilising the space for is um, how this knowledge uh, can be used to ref reframe uh, environmental assessment. Um, for us to do that, we've kind of uh, spread our kupinga, our nyuta, pretty wide. Um, we have a, a puna of mātauranga from across uh, Te Hikuotika, or the North Island, um, spanning from Te Taitokero. Um, where we have knowledge holders, um, leaders, um, researchers and advisors. Uh, we also have a puna uh, here where I'm from, Taronga Mona, um, with the likewise contributions. Um, and then we have another puna uh, from Te Tai Rafiti um, at Te Akauki, uh, Tokumaru and Uawa. And so we're very fortunate to have that space with us to uh, move forward. Um, I think it's also important to um, just mention before I, I move into the other slides is that um, what I'm going to talk about this evening uh, in a brief mode anyway, is really the, the processes that we've looked at and how we've 
um, I guess, stemmed our investigations into this space. Um, and I only say this because I think it's more important for when the outcomes come out um, that the people of, or the people of those places speak for them themselves. So, um, kia ora. Uh, next slide, please, Linda. Um, so, in terms of Maramataka, um, we've been very fortunate in Aotearoa. Um, there's been a revival, uh, for want of a better word, in the space, but there's also been a real connection or revival of this knowledge across the Pacific. Um, one of the instincts that we always look at is um, what does maramataka mean to us? Um, and I guess uh, putting it in simple terms, it's a natural timestamp, a way to assess time. It's an indigenous way of looking at how time moves through space. And so for us, maramataka, uh, really began, uh, if we look at our um, slide from left to right, uh, where our atuas sit. And so our atua in this context, uh, things that give us a timestamp throughout the year. Um, and this includes our, our mata of hina, or our moons, uh, our lunar cycles. Um, in a larger context, um, the timestamps of our different fetu, uh, navigating their ways through our um, evenings and then also uh, through our seasons um, where it's kind of understood through Pumanu Tera. Um, one of the key aspects that we look at in terms of these well up to our spaces is how our tupuna uh, understood what this meant. Um, and so for us, there's many, I guess, connections to look at um, and a lot of contributions that have been put before us. Uh, we know that a lot of our knowledge derives from our Tūrāko, um, um, including the Kete o Te, o te Wānanga. Um, but what it more importantly tells us is that our tūpuna understood these instances um, in a way that um, showed how energy transfer and process happen um, and, and contribute that into our space uh, or a knowledge set um, for dissemination within their own spaces. And so that's kind of the, the biggest area that we've invested our time in, um, looking at uh, if an instance happens in terms of a timestamp, a uh, certain moon arises uh, upon a certain um, constellation um, at a certain point uh, through the certain times of the year, um, we are liken um, a lot of our time in those times um, examples for fish spawning uh, and the like, uh, and as well as migrations. Um, the cool thing for us is that our tupuna um, laid the foundation of what that knowledge looked like, um, and so that's where a lot of our investigation has been. Um, but more importantly for us, what kind of function does it tell us the environment is doing? Uh, so what we're beginning to build, I guess, is the timestamp of these natural processes. Uh, through time and space. Um, the biggest advocate for us as, as tangata is looking at how we interpret that space, uh, but more importantly, involve ourselves in those spaces. And so in, in this instance, um, what our biggest advocate is once we've reclaimed knowledge is what kind of inquiry or practice do we put in place uh, to understand these processes further. Um, we're pretty lucky um, around um, at present, we've got a myriad of tools, I guess, to collect information um, and also a myriad of ways to share information as well. Um, next slide, please. I guess one of the biggest um, scopes of how we look at our, our work is really um, how do we measure ourselves? Um, I guess the work for us um, began in terms of creating uh, initial engagement with these whanos, uh, understanding if this is a priority for them, um, but more importantly, um, making sure that if we we're going to um, go through a, a type of project like this, uh, how do we embed it in the whanau post the project? Um, and so the biggest uh, context that we look in is through partnerships. And so partnerships come in many forms. Um, there's a natural uh, partnership with 
the, the research project and knowledge holders ourselves. Um, but there's also partnerships um, that we don't see um, that our, our um, place-based um, communities put, put themselves into as well. And those partnerships can span from anywhere within their local communities, um, across their governance spaces, um, and also across the Pacific. And so we were fortunate enough to have um, uh, a Fano no Fano from Hawaii to bring in their knowledge of Maramataka, um, and it just expanded in that way across the Pacific and, and, and showed some likeness in terms of our pursuits and understanding this knowledge. Um, the other area that we really um, are mindful of is how we contribute to the space. Um, and so contributions can be really looked at in many forms, but there's initially the form that uh, was contributed through the development of the project and the, and the pun of knowledge that gets contributed to the project. Um, but it's more so the contributions of where that knowledge goes. Um, so and what I mean by that is that um, through the project, um, we've had teachers um, and the like, you know, and then they've enveloped uh, the, the discussions that we've had from this project within their putters. And so by themselves, they've taken the initiative to understand uh, the kaupapa, understand it in a context that they can disseminate themselves, uh, but more importantly, contribute that knowledge into their own setting and places. And I th we, we think that's very valuable to, to mention. Uh, meaningful outcomes is always uh, uh, a challenge, not a challenge, it's, it's, it's a discussion around um, why are we doing this and who are we doing it for. Um, the biggest thing that we all always, sorry about that, my computer is about to restart. Um, the biggest challenge that we always look at is if we move into this project, how do we move into this project so that at the end of it we don't have a drop? Um, what that means is, is that the Fano can take the project up um, if it's a priority for them and move on with it. And more importantly, they can share that knowledge with other groups and they can pick up those knowledge sets as well. And so for us, that's kind of what meaningful outcomes is. Um, and one of the biggest things that we always are mindful of. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to share, this is the last slide, uh, and it's probably more importantly, um, I guess, a collation of, of everything. Um, the biggest advocate that we always try and determine is how we look at our player. Um, and we know that our tupuna left a foundation for us to look at a tile or a worldview to give an understanding of how our tile works and functions. And so what we've been trying to do is understand that and then apply it in today's settings because we truly believe that uh, knowledge is good, um, recited on and understood, um, but you can't really understand it until you put it into practice. And so what we aim to do is go from a, a space of reclamation of knowledge um, to a space where knowledge can be practiced and then practice can be taught. Um, and for that, you have to look at how you view the world and what kind of uh, lens, I guess, you look through. And so for this kaupapa, our lens has been through our, our Atua domains, our Kamanui uh, uh, the cycles of our Fetu, uh, the micro cycles of our lunar phases, um, and then putting in places some priority things to look at. And so in some cases, our whānau look, want to look at specific shellfish. And in some cases, um, our Fano want to look at how we could manage um, biosecurity threats. And so understanding how we can look through the lens, how we understand the rhythms of those species that we're looking at, um, eventuate into, I guess, some hua for putting things in, into practice. And, and in this case, um, we look through our Atua domains, um, the knowledge from our tūpuna, and put those into practice through um, monitoring plans that we've just began um, with some of our case studies. Um, so in earnest, um, that's kind of what we aim to do, uh, not decolonize, uh, <laughs> uh, which sometimes can be a strong word, but rethink and retrain ourselves to look through a different lens and understand that knowledge can come in many forms. 
Kia ora. Kia ora, Kane. Thank you for that. Um, we'll, just conscious of time, we'll flick straight into uh, your presentation, Jason. Just a few slides and then we will have some questions. Kia ora, Linda. Uh, kia ora, tātou. Um, thanks for the opportunity to just share a little bit about our uh, research. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, some research that we've, uh, we did in phase one and then how that's leading into the uh, research on phase two. So uh, I was very privileged to uh, be part of a team of uh, Māori and non-Māori researchers in uh, the first phase of the challenge uh, to look at uh, the Māori marine economy. So understanding what the Māori marine economy or the marine economy looks like from a Māori point of view. And the title for our research was called Fai Rawa, Fai Mana, Fai Oranga, creating a world leading indigenous blue marine economy. And uh, our team of nine researchers, uh, we spent about two days having a bit of a wānanga, having a, having a discussion for about two days on what our definition of Māori marine economy was. And we went all around the world and all around in circles. And we actually arrived back at the title of our research, Fai Rawa, Fai Mana, Fai Oranga. Because in, inside that, uh, that term there, uh, we've got uh, rawa, which is resource, so the pursuit of uh, resources or economic resources, fai mana, uh, in terms of power and authority and the ability to do things, uh, and also fai oranga, uh, the pursuit of well-being uh, in its many dimensions, both in terms of our human uh, well-being, but also the well-being of our oceans and so forth. Inside that, uh, that uh, phase one research project, there were four main elements. One was a literature review. So we, we tried to read and write about everything that had been written about the Māori marine economy, which uh, talked, uh, which covered the sort of, uh, uh, sort of early uh, Māori uh, sort of engagement with the Moana and Aotearoa. Uh, and it covered some ground that uh, Anaru talked about, uh, and also some of the concepts that Kane has also uh, investigating as well, but also contemporary Māori uh, marine uh, economy focusing on fisheries. Then we looked at some case studies. So we wanted to understand uh, how Māori marine-based enterprises were applying Māori values, Māori knowledge to the business of fishing in the main. And so we looked at uh, seven case studies of tribes, sub-tribes, uh, family level uh, enterprises, and also pan-tribal uh, Māori marine enterprises, and, uh, and we, we looked at that as well. Then we also tried to map the Māori marine economy in two ways. One is to, uh, I guess, trying to understand the institutions which govern and uh, drive Māori fisheries in, in particular, but also to quantify to some extent the value of the assets within the Māori marine economy. And then the, the last bit there, the, the engagement. So like Cain, uh, engaging with uh, Māori, uh, whether that's Māori communities, Māori enterprises, was an important element of our research as well. Next one. So uh, part of the research really wanted to focus on uh, Māori marine-based enterprises. And uh, in this slide, you'll see uh, some of the Māori marine enterprises that we uh, wrote case studies about. We talked with them and we uh, tried to understand the nature of their activity and how they were applying Māori values. Uh, and what we focused on is this concept of kaitiaki-centred business models. And kaitiaki means uh, guardianship or stewardship, uh, the practice of really uh, being a good steward of both uh, physical and human uh, communities uh, and, and how these Māori values and the the kind of knowledge that Kane is talking about uh, was being applied within these contemporary Māori enterprises, whether that's tribal or private Māori enterprises. And this little diagram here, is, there's, a, there's a, a, a report which covers all the case studies, but this little diagram here introduces some Māori concepts which explain, I guess, the, uh, the framework uh, that, uh, of, of kaitiaki-centred business models. And you'll see, and I'll just briefly explain them. Now, rangatiratanga, 
that is the chiefly authority and the, uh, I guess, the tribal authority and the self-determination that tribes and uh, Māori collectives, Māori enterprises in particular, have to determine their aspirations, their uh, objectives, and how they want to do stuff and what they want to do. Uh, what that enables, you know, when you've got rangatiratanga and you're actively applying and exercising rangatiratanga, it means that you are actually have a big responsibility, which is kaitiakitanga, being a good steward, being a good guardian of uh, both the marina resources and your communities. And when you've got kaitiakitanga, well, you've got whanaunga tanga there, which is your relationships, relationships with both your people, your communities, but also your relationships with tangaro, uh, the ocean resources. So how do you be a good steward and also run a good enterprise uh, using that principle of kaitiakitana, manakitana, looking after people and uh, te aotearoa, the uh, te taiao, the environment as well. And then also whairawa was another principle which we uh, tried to understand how did these Māori marine enterprises uh, pursue economic development, whairawa. Now, mana uh, whakahaere, you know, once you've got uh, all of these sort of values operating within these enterprises, then you've got this idea of governing and managing your enterprise to achieve these kinds of uh, principles and objectives. Next one, yes, Linda. Now, inside the business of fishing, the Māori uh, fisheries and uh, the Māori marine economy, uh, there's, a, there's this complicated institutional environment which is really uh, sort of controlling how things uh, get done and who's doing what and uh, Anadu touched on a, a little bit of this through the settlement legislation and all of that st stuff that's come through now it's a complicated picture so take some time to have a look at it later on and again there's another report that explains uh, this this image but what it's trying to say is that uh, despite Māori aspirations uh, for kaitiaki centered business models, uh, for customary and commercial fisheries and Māori approaches to engaging with the, the marine economy. Uh, there are government regulations, institutions, crown agencies uh, and organisations set up to explain and govern how uh, the business of uh, Māori marine uh, enterprises operate. You know, and what the uh, what the uh, the research was saying was well, uh, how can we repaint this institutional uh, framework to to look more like uh, some of the concepts that Kane was talking about, Anneli was talking about, and also Linda, and also EBM, you know, sort of a Aotearoa New Zealand view of EBM uh, with that that uh, those Maori principles and Matara the Maori embedded within it. Next one, please. Now this brings us to the second phase of the research. So we uh, we've uh, we must have done something right. So we we're invited to have another go at doing some more research. Uh, so we've uh, we've formulated another team to focus on a, a phase two research project. The, the research project this time is called uh, Project Two Point Three, uh, Indigenizing the Blue Economy in Aotearoa. So it's thinking about in the future, what does our vision of a blue economy look like in Aotearoa from an indigenous perspective? And then how do we transition our Māori marine based enterprises and the institutions that govern that environment and that activity uh, toward that vision? So our research goal is that we will partner with Māori to explore and support Māori who aspire to a blue economy imbued with Māori knowledge, treaty principles, a focus on Māori well-being, human potential, relational balance with our tipuna, our ancestor Tangaroa. Uh, so, you know, it's a pretty ambitious goal. So we'll, uh, we'll see how we go. Phase one research, the Māori marine economy, sort of defining what that looks like. It focused on the traditional and contemporary structure of the Māori marine economy uh, and mapping what that looks like. Now, in between phase one and phase two, um, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. John Reed from Naitau Research Center, who leads this research with me, uh, he did some research sort of talking to Māori business leaders and hapu and iwi and, and uh, Māori people who have a, 
you know, a deep interest in the Māori marine economy to understand, well, what are the constraints? What's hampering uh, our, our whānau and our iwi, our tribes and our families from getting into the business of uh, the Māori marine economy? Key constraints, fragmentation of assets, uh, uncertainty around property rights, uh, and also this idea of corporation community divide. Settlement assets generally uh, were centralized within sort of large tribal organizations, but then you've got whānau, families in coastal communities wanting to re-engage in the business and activity of the, marine, the Māori marine economy. How do you bring them together? And then lastly, um, what does kaitiaki-centered business practice actually look like? Now, those sorts of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, those kinds of trends and, and, and uh, constraints allowed us to sort of develop an idea for this phase two research project, Indigenizing the Blue Economy. <coughs> it's by Susie, catch up with you. Uh, three themes. Uh, um, our phase two research project focuses on three themes. First one is pa heko heko, or integration, the idea of uh, bringing uh, Māori enterprises together, working together with non-Māori enterprises and other stakeholders uh, to realise Māori aspirations in the Māori marine economy. Uh, <clears throat> so how do, we, how do we do that? And how are these Māori marine enterprises approaching pa heko heko? Uh, the second theme uh, is aiwahatana, or innovation, differentiation. So how do we create uh, products and services and activities uh, and enterprises that are uh, built on Indigenous knowledge uh, as a basis for innovation? And uh, the third theme there is whakatautika, or balance. You know, uh, this idea of uh, making sure that there's a good connection between the tribe, and the hapu or the sub-tribe and the families, uh, which, uh, who are the kaitiaki, who are the guardians of their marine spaces and are wanting to engage in and utilize the resources that are there. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, and then the, how we are approaching that is basically uh, case studies with uh, Māori marine enterprises that are engaging uh, in this research and also activity uh, to understand, well, how do these things sort of play out in their, in their work? And then uh, we're going to try to synthesize or make sense of uh, all of this uh, knowledge and insight uh, for both the, uh, the participating Māori enterprises, but also policymakers and, and other researchers, uh, our colleagues uh, across the challenge and other challenges as well. Uh, kia ora. Kia ora, Jason. Thank you for that. Um... So I see, um, Jen, you have your hand raised and I, I, I would encourage people as well to pop some questions into the Q&A box for us to be able to look at. But um, in the meantime, Jan, um, feel free to ask your question. might be a, a bit of an issue there. Um, perhaps, Jan, if you could put your question in the Q&A box, that would be great. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for some of those questions to come through, just to thank um, everybody for their presentation, and I'll kick us off with some questions. Um, hopefully, uh, the Q&A box is working okay for everybody. But um, I guess I thought I would start with, for both you, Kane and Jason, um, around how you've found partnering with Māori and uh, as partners or as leaders in your research and, and um, you know, what have some of the challenges and successes been in that? Thanks, Jason. I'll go first, my bro. Um, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I guess um, our mahi uh, naturally gravitates to uh, 
our Māori whānau, um, and to contextualise that, um, we've kind of grown up, or I have anyway, uh, in a space where our kaitaki um, are navigating through a space to apply themselves in a world that's foreign in their own backyard, if that makes any sense. Um, and so uh, we have kaitaki uh, uh, in the mona, so to speak, who are uh, dealing with resource consents, uh, the pressures of changing their environments, uh, the questions from their whānau of where's our kaimona gone. And so for us, we naturally gravitate to that space because we think uh, it's our duty to help them. Uh, we have some knowledge to help them facilitate the conversation, um, but we also know that when our whānau are given uh, the right space uh, and resourcing uh, the innovation to tackle problems. And so um, I, I might be biased or be the wrong person to ask, but I, I always work with those, those groups. That's, that's, that's why I got into the space. Uh, <laughs> Hope that it helps. Jason. Kia ora, kia ora. Well, um, uh, I guess um, the what we were keen to do uh, very early on is is to engage with uh, Māori in the research project as partners, as opposed to uh, stakeholders or research participants or anything like that. Is really to um, I guess to work with uh, Māori who had the time and the capacity uh, and wanted to work with work with us uh, as partners. And what that means in practical terms is, is basically establishing a relationship uh, and uh, resourcing that partnership uh, appropriately and adequately so that the, you know, the research partners, our, our Māori case studies in this case, um, have a little bit of um, huru huru, you know, uh, for the um, for the money to fly, you know, it's got to have for the bird to fly, it's got to have some uh, feathers, right? And, and uh, so resources is uh, is is uh, is part of that. And so we were just keen to make sure that um, we're working together uh, to figure out well, how does this research contribute to the achievement of Māori aspirations, and what are those aspirations? And Linda outlined that. Uh, so, um, you know, I think that's part of it, and we've tried to extend that approach in this phase two approach, uh, project by, um, ex you know, sort of expanding the role of the partner as, uh, and providing resources for them to be able to engage their own iwi researchers to, to lead the data collection process. And, I mean, in practical terms, with COVID, the way it is, it's pretty tough to get around the country and... Uh, and to do the kind of research that we were doing in phase one. Uh, so we've, you know, we've got to think differently about that now in practical terms. That means uh, having and relying on uh, iwi to, you know, to be the researchers, uh, to collect the data and, and for us to partner with them and acknowledge that. Kia ora. Kia bye, kia ora. Um, We've got a question actually in the chat. So, um, what opportunities do you see for sharing this approach with other Indigenous peoples and other scientists during the oceans decade? Perhaps start with you, Jason. Well, kia ora. I mean, um, I think this seminar or this webinar is a good start, um, but ideally, you know, uh, it comes down to hui or meetings and conferences, uh, you know, the, the usual way we would do that. And I think, uh, you know, if it were possible for us to travel overseas and, uh, and have a bit of a conference about that, uh, uh, you know, about this work, I think that would be, that would be one way of doing it. But um, the other is, is really um, thinking about the different levels of engagement. Now, Kane can talk better about this than me. It's what would be awesome would be to have uh, kaitiaki from uh, different indigenous uh, peoples uh, for them to be supported to have their own conferences, you know, to share indigenous knowledge about 
uh, uh, traditional and contemporary practice in the uh, the marine economy. I think that would be something worth supporting and doing if it's not already occurring. Okay, kia ora. Kane, did you want to add anything to that or Anaru? Yeah, um, really good question. And um, those uh, types of questions uh, really excite me because um, what, what we've found, uh, or what we know, uh, I guess as, us as Māori is that um, a lot of our knowledge is place-based um, and just seeing the innovation around the three places involved in the project that I, I just mentioned um, there's actually three worldviews, if you want to call it that, um, that's been expressed in those spaces. Um, the cool thing that happens in those spaces is the innovation um, and, and the, not the challenge of knowledge, um, but just the understanding of knowledge. Um, the other one too is that we have been fortunate enough, as I mentioned earlier, to hear some of the uh, work done across the Pacific. Um, and what I did notice in that space is it's kind of uh, gives another energy boost to our whānau in, in these spaces because uh, one, sometimes they're navigating through it without any reference um, and then when they see whānau from across the Pacific, say Hawaii or Tahiti, uh, dealing with the same instances and coming up with the same challenges but also overcoming those challenges um, it actually creates quite a powerful narrative. And so um, I think our, our friend here is, is hinting on, on something for us to pursue with him um, around uh, co-leading all our Indigenous people across the Pacific and across uh, uh, the world. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of stuff really excites me, I guess. Um, yeah, win-win uh, in my perspective. Anaru, did you want to add anything? Um, no. I think the, uh, Jason and, and Kane have covered it quite well. Kafai. Thank you for that question, Zalaika. Uh, Daryl Sykes from the New Zealand Rock Lobster Industry Council has asked a question. Um, the concept of tikanga, which Daryl assumes is based on observation and experience, both relevant to specific areas or fishing grounds, does the current scale of fisheries management as informed by science and research compromise those original belief systems? For example, a stock assessment for species with con within confirmed stock boundaries informs the setting of catch limits, takes into account the spawning stock biomass, etc. Does this overwhelm or overrule local tikanga and how do we incorporate and update that tikanga? And I might... I might, yeah. Okay. Um, of course, Kane, you could jump in here too. Um, thank you for your uh, question, Daryl. And I suppose um, I'll, I'll come from an angle of uh, being in recent discussions, of, well, in the last few years with um, Fisheries New Zealand and how they um, looking at stock assessments. Um, and I suppose some of it comes down to the 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 um, the method that the that the fish stock, uh, stock assessment is done. So um, if you're doing a trawl survey to make an assessment, okay, sorry, just security have come into the office. <laughs> um, and, and they, um, they uh, you know, trawling and to look at what species are in abundance and what their numbers might be in a particular area, fisheries management area. Um, Trawling, as we know, can sometimes be quite detrimental to the, the rest of the environment um, within the marine environment. Um, and, and, and some fish, iwi fisheries forms feel, is there another way to do that? Numbers still aren't showing much. Um, and in terms of tikanga, um, you know, there must be another way to be able to, to assess those stocks. Um, and it might be more expensive and not as efficient as well. Uh, and also sometimes to some extent doing those stock assessments, and I know that's not the case, but um, generally, but there was a case where fish was being dumped, um, 
been counted and then dumped and it's not used for anything else. So it's just, oh, um, putting something back into the marine environment that's dead, um, which is, is in our, our world view, a, a child of, of, of the deity, um, Tangaroa, um, of the marine environment. So, um, but by all means, uh, can, could, that, could that change? Um, um, time might tell and legislation might enable that. Um, but there has been a, a um, what's been noticed is um, if we're bringing in the, the maturanga and the, so forth, the tikanga into uh, science and or putting it beside science, we have two knowledge sets that can actually support um, some great initiatives, um, some great pathways forward and, and ultimately the sustainability of a particular species or any species within the marine environment. Kane, do you have anything to add to that? That, that was really good, Andrew. Thank you. Um, I, I'm I'm always mindful of the kupu tikanga um, and who holds the mana to give the tikanga for that space. Um, so <laughs> it's it's I find it very hard to put tikanga in the space of commercial fishing, uh, to be honest. And that's just my personal preference because um, that's not how I understand tikanga to be placed. Um, so. I don't have anything else to add to that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Good point. Uh, Jason. Kia ora. Um, that is a good question. Um, and I just, just wanted to add a little bit to it. And uh, in, in the phase one research that we did, we had, um, we had uh, some kōrero with uh, some Māori who are involved in fisheries and fishing, the business of fishing. And uh, what they had noticed is that the quota limits were kind of um, set too high for them. You know, they decided amongst themselves, uh, seeing what they were seeing every day uh, for from an iwi perspective, that the limits were actually too high. And they had uh, made a, a decision um, not to catch to the to the limit, uh, in order to sustain what they could see was, you know, uh, an at risk uh, fishery. The problem with that is that you know ultimately the other fishers are going to sort of jump in there and carry on, uh, because who has the money? You know, who has the money to to set those? Well, it's not Maori, uh, and it's not mana whenua necessarily. So. Um, it comes back to the institutional environment and the extent to which, uh, you know, that uh, those institutions uh, provide for a Māori perspective, uh, provide for treaty, you know, sort of treaty-based uh, relationships and, um, and also um, sharing of power and sharing of decision-making around uh, what's appropriate in a given space. And what we also found is in some of the case study research is that uh, where <clears throat> Māori have uh, led a sort of processes of figuring out, well, what, what is the plan for our coastal environment or our marine environment, they've brought on board um, a whole range of stakeholders, local government, business, Pākehā, Māori, uh, and others uh, to figure that out, you know, and using tikanga Māori to do that both in terms of the process and the outcome, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, all groups have found quite, quite, um, quite acceptable and, and coming up with a good plan. So I think there's evidence to suggest that there, there, there is a better way and, and a role for tikanga in that process. Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, moving through, we've got a few questions now. One from... Serena, um, do you see Mātauranga Māori being incorporated in future legislation? I, I might start with that one. Um, one of our uh, research projects that I mentioned, um, looking at the relationship between tribal law and uh, government law, um, one of the insights to come out of that is that um, often the use of um, Māori knowledge and in particular Māori language and legislation um, can have significant limitations because it's often used completely out of context. So although there is a growth in New Zealand, I think, of the use of Māori knowledge and language in legislation with great intention, 
um, sometimes its application um, doesn't always work out as, as well as I think was probably intended. Does anybody else on the panel have anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, the, I mean, it comes back to the point about, um, you know, um, Anadu mentioned um, the, um, you know, the, what is it, Conservation Act, and, um, and inside the Conservation Act and, and lots of other New Zealand legislation, there is provision for um, those Crown departments and Crown entities to uh, to give effect to the Treaty of Waitangi and its principles in their activity. So there is an obligation uh, on those departments to, uh, to do that. And as part, what comes with that obligation is an expectation that uh, Mātauranga Māori will find its way into the activity and the business of those entities. The issue is, as Linda's pointed out, is uh, how do you ensure the integrity of the Mātauranga that is uh, that is that is shared and operationalized in those institutions, and that's a big challenge. Um, and you know, whatever the legislation says, there's there's an operational dimension as well to how that's given effect. Good point. Um, we've got a question here from Andy. Um, in terms of, of, of your work, Kane, and um, the Ropu Mahi involved to reclaim and preserve ancestral tools such as maramataka, uh, are there discussions around shifts in environmental cues, variations within seasons, um, and are there whānau responding to these shifts in cues by changing practice, for example? Mm, sure, I think it's a really good question. I think um, there's two things to consider here. Um, so in terms of maramataka, uh, those constants are, uh, in their cycles are happening, um, performing their cycles um, to a T. And what I mean by that is that those timestamps really ever change. Um, what they're also, um, we understand in, in the research that we're doing is that there's also other timestamps um, based on how the environment um, is absorbing or retracting on different elements. And so those create another timestamp in themselves. And so sometimes they can be misjudged uh, as um, and differences, I guess, in the maramataka. Um, so a good example um, that one of our researchers uh, or our advisors help us with is, is looking at water. And so uh, the water um, ebbs and flows in terms of its mass within our whenua um, throughout a cycle of a year, and that ebb and flow of that mass changes depending on how much water is around. And naturally, our, our taonga that live in those spaces um, adapt to that as well. And sometimes that gives up, gives off different toku uh, around what their functions are. Although uh, someone kind of could have seen it on a different maramataka the year before and go back to that same place, um, sometimes those things change. Um, in terms of looking at cues, um, we always talk around um, our tupuna's involvement in intervention. And so an intervention is um, the tile is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, the modi or energy from those spaces uh, are not being created more efficiently. Um, we need to have a discussion around what's happening in this space. And so um, some of our uh, advisors on this pro on our project, and um, one of them being uh, a mentor of ours, uh, Pa Ropota, um, uh, Robert McGowan, I think most people know him as, uh, understands the cycles of a lot of our, our, our rako here in, in Taronga Mona. Um, and so 
he was actually one of the people that initiated the space to start looking at Maramataka um, more in depthly because he is, in, in his understanding, um, flower cycles are changing, um, um, whether their cycles happen on an environmental cycle or a maramataka, maramataka cycle. Uh, and more importantly, a lot of the regeneration or re recruiting or uh, natural succession of those plants isn't happening as well. And so um, for him, the credit are uh, a matter of urgency. Um, and he's um, uh, in his discussion. That's kind of what kicked off the, the project for us. So to kind of answer your question, yes, um, there are people who know, to, know those cues, um, but there's also people who are, um, and I, I'll put my hand up and be one of them, trying to understand and familiarise ourselves with those cues as well. Um, um, kia ora. Kia ora, Kane. Um, a question from Natalie here. Oh, actually, first, just a, a, a response from Daryl um, to the answers that you gave to his question, um, noting that um, that voluntary catch constraints aren't just unique to Māori fishing operators. And there's a well-documented history of commercial rights holders taking such initiatives over decades as well. Uh, rock, rock lobster and power fisheries in particular. Um, and Daryl just notes that he holds to the con that the concept of kaitiakitanga is strongly engendered by the New Zealand fisheries management system. So that was just um, a comment in response to the answers. But a question here from Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Um, what would you advise non-Indigenous researchers around the world to keep in mind when working in co-developed projects? What are the most important attitudes to bring into these conversations? Who wants to go first? Jason, or Kane, you've unmuted. Uh, we've been very polite. Um, thank you guys for allowing me to go first. Um, we, um, and I can only speak from uh, the instances that I work with. Um, Paolo Pata is a good example. Um, you know, he's openly says he's Pākehā, but he thinks like a Māori. Um, he understands the pressures that uh, Māori people go through and he wants to inject himself and in helping in that space. Um, we also, in the current project, have um, Pākehā researchers, I hate using that word in this context, but um, who are very open to give their knowledge but more importantly, help the whanos navigate through the spaces that they've been finding hard to navigate through. And so application is more how do we apply ourselves and what role do we give ourselves in those spaces and then um, turning into that into a cause or help for that kaupapa. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's all I can say. Jason, Jason, you want to add to that? Yeah, kia ora, kia ora. Um, I think um, like uh, <clears throat> the the it's it's an opportunity for a collaboration that's needed, you know, because the if you look at the scale of the research, uh, indigenous research that's uh, being undertaken, you know, there's just not enough indigenous researchers out there. Uh, to do the research that's needed and and sought by indigenous communities, so um, you know it's an opportunity to collaborate and to. I think the main thing for non-indigenous researchers is to be open uh, to new knowledge, new perspectives, uh, and to um, you know to 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 do what we, we would normally do in any situation, which is to be respectful of uh, other people and. Uh, their, you know, their ways of thinking and doing, and and to be opening open to learning about that. And uh, research is a great way to uh, to do that. Uh, research collaborations, and that's been the case for us in our research. Uh, we've got a a fantastic uh, park here researcher uh, called Dr. M Matt Rout, Matthew Rout, from Naito Research Centre. He is amazing, you know, and we're just so blessed to have him. 
uh, and um, and there are others as well um, who, who are sort of like that, who, who have a really wonderful and important contribution to make. Anaru, I might give you the last word um, on that question because you've um, both been um, now involved in the research sector, but also from a, an iwi uh, point yeah. of view. Okay. Um Kia ora, Natalie, and thank you for your um, question. And just to add, um, Jason said earlier, um, one of the key things to keep in mind is creating that relationship first and foremost. Um, once that's created and once that is strengthened, um, anything can be said. You can talk um, freely, you end up potentially, so if you had to go to an area, um, do not look at it as, well, my project is two years long, Think of beyond the two years, because the relationship that you'll uh, make and the connection you'll make will be, you'll always have them at that, um, backing you up um, for the good outcome. So always maintain that um, strong relationship. Um, being humble, um, you would be an expert in, in what you do, um, and they'll have ex knowledge and expertise in what they do. And if you, when I mean, bringing those two knowledge sets again, um, closer together, um, it's amazing what things, what, what can happen and what, what um, the outcomes that, and the impact that they can make. Um, and, and just, yeah, I, I suppose there's no more I can say apart from that relationship is the strongest thing. And being familiar with um, an understanding of the situation that those uh, Māori communities might be in at that time um, and being cognizant of that and being respectful of that as Jason has highlighted. But otherwise, you know, have fun at the same time. Do not be scared. Um, if you're being fearful, they might go, well, we don't want to deal with you. But if you're open and honest, um, straight up, uh, that definitely the respect will come. Kia ora. Kia ora. And um, it is now 7.29 and um, the session concludes literally in a minute. Um, thank you, Natalie, for that response too. Um, so with that said, um, just again, thank everybody who has joined us for the session today um, and to our uh, panelists, our presenters. Um, it's been a good spend of an hour and a half. Um, some thank yous coming through in the chat as well. Uh, with that said, I will close, since I see no opened our um, session up with a karakia, um, I will close our session up with a karakia. Uh, me inoi tātou, uh, kia tau te rangi marie o te rangi e tui honei, o papa tua naku e takoto nei, o te tai au e afi nei. Ki rongi a tātou, tē mauri ora. Mauri ora. So may the peace of the sky above of the earth below and of all of the embracing universe be upon us all. Thanks very much, everybody. Few still signing off. Thank you, Jane.